Welcome to the Sailor Noob Podcast, where a super fan and a noob talk about the original Sailor Moon episode by episode. I'm your host, Mikan Hana, joined by my co-host. I'm the co-host and the noob, Caliban, and I'm ready to get it on. We're, yeah. ah, we're a couple of magical people ready to moon crisis make up this episode. Today we are talking about episode number 157, Pegasus ga Kieta Yure Ugoku Yujo in Japanese. Pegasus Disappears, Wavering Friendship, the English translation, and the English title, Dream Believer. Goku? Goku? Goku. U- Ugoku. Go. Ugoku. You go. <laughs> yeah. You go. Sounds like a uh, Eastern European car commercial. Uh, yeah. Well, good. Yeah. Because, honestly, and I wish this was true of everybody, but for me, the mind... It resets, doesn't it? Yeah. From trauma. Oh, my God. <laughs> you at something, and then you go back like, I don't know what you mean. Doesn't look like anything to me. Yeah, right. So now I'm, fu, fu, hit, hit, fu. <laughs> I'm like Rocky. I'm like, fuck, fuck. <laughs> Box in a log. I'm pulling the sled. Oh, yeah, yeah, Box sure. on fire. Right? Yeah. Wouldn't that prove that the... Russian wilderness makes Russian boxers better than Americans. Anyway, that's what that's what the big series of montages in Rocky Four is all about. Oh, I haven't seen we Rocky Four. See... Thanks for being honest. Yeah, and not lying like Mr. Mom. <laughs> we see Drago running in the the you know the most advanced gyms. Bridget Nielsen's shooting him up with, you know, ball shrinking juice. Oh my god. He's run he's he's boxing robots and he's getting his DNA red and all that. And then oh meanwhile, god. Rambo moves to Siberia, lives in a cabin, grows a beard, and he's just out like picking up rocks. He picks up rocks, right? Yeah. And twists, it's like a medicine ball, puts him in the sled, then he's gotta yeah. pull the sled. And he's like literally like vertical, just like or horizontal, like face down in the snow, like pulling the sled. Yes. And then he's jogging and some old guy, you know, on on the Dasha, like his his tractor breaks down, he's like and he helps him out, you know, and so that's part of the workout. And he's like, Thanks. He's like, Oh, those for done, yeah, okay. <laughs> You know, it's it, the natural, the, the fire to win, your heart on fire. Yes. That's the key. Not all these scientific juices, you know, and, and, and punching a, a robot or something like that. <laughs> Not Polly's robot. Uh, rest in peace. What is Polly's robot? It's Rocky IV. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's the thing. But the thing is, he's not doing this in Pittsburgh. He's doing it in Russia. Right. So is it something about the Russian air that gives him the russian power to beat russian man i guess so or yes. is this just the i can do this anywhere thing because remember he did uh, it before on the streets and famously the steps of philadelphia yeah right so it's like, from, the, from, the, from the urban jungle to the russian step <laughs> he's doing the same thing that's true I mean, maybe it, the being with it, breathing the Russian air and doing all these things in Russia is what helps him beat the Russian boxer. So I think it's the second thing I said. Oh, you think so? But I'm glad that we uh, have different and interesting opinions. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, I feel like Ivan Drago, and I say to this show, I must break you. So, do we have anything from our wonderful listeners this week? Uh, I don't know if they're wonderful, <laughs> but we've got something. <laughs> I got them. Uh, yeah, actually, we do. Uh, on every episode, we read Spotify answers to the question, what did you think about this episode? <laughs> on our Spotify page or on every individual episode of our show that appears on Spotify, there is a Q&A section that allows you to answer the question, what did you think about this episode? Yes. We encourage you to do it. And we've got a couple answers from that question for our last episode. Okay. Episode 156, Don't Lose Sight of Your Dreams, The Mirror of Truth. Yeah. Which, I don't know if any of that has anything to do with actually happening in the episode, but 
Uh, we have listener Ribbon who has said, I wish bad guys always used the same mansion Nephrite had, just changing decor for the new baddies aesthetic. <laughs> I like all that right, idea. Get these spooky skeletons out of here. I'm all about French horns or, or something. <laughs> um, yeah, that would be funny. I, Nephrite's had a appearing and disappearing mansion. It seemed to disappear. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if it stuck around uh, once he, um, old spoiler alert, uh, shuffled off this um, evil coil. But, <laughs> but yeah, I could see that. Yeah. And they've just got like the lease going. Maybe every season could start with a new villain uh, going, it's nice. A lot of space, a lot of light. <laughs> who's the evil realtor who's like selling it <laughs> to these people? That's the story I want to hear. Yeah, right. That's your prequel right there. Yeah. 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 Uh, what is it going to take for me to get you into this yeah, house? Exactly. It's a little drafty, but uh, that's what you want, right? <laughs> You're evil. It's character. Uh, so thanks for pointing that out, Ribbon. And then listener Sedarian writes, I might have a reason for why they wanted larger eyes, referring to the uh, characters okay. in the episode who are like, my eyes aren't big enough. My eyes are cuter. Sedarian says, it was a pretty common thing in anime for villains, foreigners, and other shady and disreputable characters to be drawn with smaller eyes. Interesting. I can see that. I think that is a good explanation. I was also thinking the other day about, I was reading somewhere about the difference between emojis uh -huh. in the West and in the East. Oh. And how emojis, like smiley face, you have a nice yeah. day. Emojis in the West are usually evaluated by their facial expression. Uh -huh. Specifically what the mouth is doing. Yes. Whereas um, like Japanese, like Eastern emojis are about the eyes, really. Interesting. And I'm not even sure when this article or this determination was made, because I think now, because of the way technology works and because of the spread of Eastern culture, I think most emojis are, you know, Eastern in nature. I think they are, too. Yeah. And so you get, like, big eyes, big eye, small eye, sweat drop. Right. You know, a, a lot of that. We kind of use them both in the West, but the expressiveness of the eyes is very important to uh, to Eastern and specifically Japanese um, psychology and like determining how somebody feels about what their reaction is or something. And so not having that could mean, yeah, that character is, is shady sure. know, or disreputable. Sure. And in an anime, you want to have your characters be expressive as possible, yes. as easily as possible um, because it's a cartoon, and so your younger viewers can figure out what's going on. And so having, like, you know, the big eyes really helps. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, in Marmalade Boy, the third season, they um, there's a lot of Americans in it. And they, they make their eyes, their eye shapes are different than the Japanese characters. So, huh. yeah. They're, instead of, like, big and wide, they are kind of slightly narrower. And... Um, <laughs> They're, they're, they it looks kind of. If you ask me, me, if you ask me, it's kind of. They kind of have an off-putting look about them. Uh -huh. They look a little like, what's going on with these people? Like it, it's 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 off-putting. Okay. And I don't think the intention was for it to be off-putting. I think it was just intentional to be like. I don't think pudding should be involved at all. No, you're right. They shouldn't. I was um, thinking of uh, Devil Man Cry Baby, the remake that was on Netflix recently. Yes. And uh, Fudo, the 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 hero is staying with his friend's family and her dad, I think it's her stepdad, but he is uh, American, I think, or he's white. He's a, he was a missionary who came to okay, Japan and then sure. just stayed there. And he is drawn a little differently. I think his eyes are drawn rounder, like just sure. more open. Yeah. Because right. it's not unlike a regular anime. It's a very quote unquote real, it's stylized, but it's more sort of realistic in terms of how the characters are depicted. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you you see that. You do see it. But when it's just a harem anime, it's just going to be all big eyes and then every yes. color of the rainbow for hair. Yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, the money spends the same. That's right. Keep it up, character designers, and keep it up, listeners. Thanks so much for answering our question for this episode and all future episodes. Yes. You can go to Spotify for the uh, episode page, the show page, and answer the question, what would you think about this episode? Well, Cal, what did you think about this episode? Could you write us a breakdown of it? I don't 
want to. You don't want to? <laughs> I don't have a choice. Okay, everybody. Thank you. That's our choice, show though. for today. I was thinking about how I have this film theory. It's just a theory. That bad films start in a certain number of ways. Okay. And one of the ways that they start is a bad... You know when you're watching a bad film, when it opens over water. Oh, sure. Yes. And what I mean by that generally is it's the helicopter shot. We all know it. Panning over the water. You're panning over water. You, you know, tilt up, pan up, and you see a city or something like that. New York City often. Robocop. Yeah, right. Robocop starts that way. (laughs) It's the Hold exception to my rule, <laughs> although you could argue that it's like an intentionally kind of schlocky and bad movie. Well, you could argue um, that. And test this out. You watch a movie and this happens. You're like, this is going to be a mediocre affair. Well, this episode opens over water. Oh, you're right. It does. We pan up from one of Tokyo's waterways and we see Chibiusa, Momoko, and Kayusuke, the main cast of this show. Yeah, right. Watching some swans. Uh-huh. As you do. Kayusuke says, they come here every winter from Siberia. Just like Rocky. Uh, <laughs> and that's all well and good. But look out! Because down the embankment towards the trio comes a kid on a bicycle with, like, a hang glider attached to it? Yeah. This is Japan. There's got to be some kind of law against this. Yeah, probably. Jimmy and her friends are just standing there, dumbstruck. Yeah. As this thing comes comes racing towards them. We cut to the furiously spinning wheels of the bike, and then we cut to a side shot of it barreling down the hill. Then we cut to the face of the kid piloting it. Then we cut to the wheels. <laughs> then we cut to a wide shot. Then we cut to the kid again. There's a lot of cutting. This smells like padding. Yeah. For a very kinetic situation, this comes off more like the guy getting crushed by the steamroller in Austin Powers. No! Watch out! Finally, the kid breaks through the barrier at the edge of the waterway. He sails out over the water for one brief second, soaring gracefully through the air before coming crashing down into the river. And the swans are like, yikes, as the kid gets up from his ruined machine. Chibi says, hey, he's from the next class over from us. And Kaisuke says, yeah, Hiroki. Hey, you're Hiroki, right? Guess we'll have to wait to find out. Because we snapped credits. <laughs> when we come back, the four kids are at the top of the hill, and Haruki is explaining to them that his dream, ding, yep. is to fly the skies freely with an airplane that he's made himself. Again, the Japanese Civil Aviation Bureau is going to want to talk to this kid. Yes. Kayasuke is like, airplane? You mean this total bike over here? And Haruki says, it's not a bike. It's the St. Louis. Uh huh. Presumably a reference to the spirit of St. Louis. Yes. The plane is. in which Charles Lindbergh made his transatlantic flight. Yes. Kayaski says, if bikes could fly, the sky would be full of them. <laughs> and Hiroki says, it'll work. I designed and built it myself. There's no way it won't fly. And Kayaski says, but it uh, didn't fly just now, though, huh? Flight skeptic Kayaski. Yeah. What else is he unsure about? Hey, man, don't fly too far or you'll fall off the edge of the earth because the earth is flat. Oh, my God. Do your own research. Well, Momo decides to research the physics of a fist hitting a face because she lays Kaiosuke out like a kimono. <laughs> and we've all wanted to do that, right? Yeah, Ever probably. since the vampire episode. Yeah. You know, vampires, they're actually real. And they're caused by the COVID vaccine. <laughs> oh, my Pow! God. Right in the kisser. <laughs> That's classic Momo. She says, idiot. Don't you understand ambition? Chibi says, it's so cool. I think it's great he's so engrossed in this. I love things like this. (laughs) And Kaisuke is like, you, you love it? (laughs) Have we been dragging this? Is this something that we have to worry about? I don't know if we've been tracking this. (laughs) Just comes back now. (laughs) Yeah. And kid, you got nothing to worry about. Spoiler alert. That's never an issue. No. She never shows a single iota of attraction to this kid. No. Throughout the rest of the episode. No. I think you're okay. Yes. But for now, Chibi grabs Hiroki's hands and says, do your best. But Hiroki pulls his hands back and says, this is my dream. Yeah. I want it to come true with me and my St. Louis. My sexy St. Louis. Oh, my God. He starts collecting the pieces of his bike. And Kaisuke is like, 
Let him go. Let him go. <laughs> and Chibi ponders this in her heart. Later in Chibi's loft, she's FaceTiming with Pegasus. And Pegasus says, <laughs> how many how many brats do I have to wingman for you? Oh, my <laughs> I mean, God. Uh, uh, maybe he's, uh, he, he's wondering if he's uh, doing the right thing. Uh, maybe he'll break his neck and die. You ever think about that? <laughs> Chibi says, wondering? And Pegasus says, he doesn't know himself how to make an airplane fly. That's why he gets upset. You know, I can actually fly because I was born with wings. <laughs> but anyway, I guess he needs friends who share his dream with him. Chibi says, I wish we could be those friends. I'll go check on him tomorrow. And Pegasus says, yeah, great, whatever. <laughs> you know, no, uh, I want to see him too. Do you know where he lives? Weird. <laughs> He says, I'm the inhabitant of a world of dreams. <laughs> and we see a vision, I guess, of Pegasus's world, which honestly we know nothing about. Very little. After like 20 episodes. Yeah. We know the ghost of a fish, tiger, and a bird yes, live there. Exactly. And that's about it. He says, In this world, I can't fly freely in the skies. <laughs> And Chibi finds herself transported to the world of dreams, the crystal forest that we've seen before. But the sky is an angry red color and a strong wind blows, tearing at Chibi. She says, where is the world of dreams? <laughs> it's 500 feet from every playground in the world. It... <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, no, I get it. Oh, my God. Uh, that took me a second. Chibi says, <laughs> sees Pegasus appear before her in the forest. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> she oh my asks, God. where in the world are you? But the wind dies as she finds herself back in her bed. As Pegasus looks wistfully out from his orb, Chibi says, all right, then I'll show you Hiroki's airplane. Leave it to me. Chibi Usagi. <laughs> we see the back of Usagi's head come up the stairs oh. to the loft. <laughs> yes. And Chibi says, barging into a lady's room without knocking. Well, I never. <laughs> and she hides the Pegasus phone behind her back. Usagi looks unhappy and she says, You were having a secret lovey-dovey phone call with Mamo-chan just now, weren't you? <laughs> oh, Usagi. It's somehow both less and more weird than that. Yeah, yeah. Chibi's like, what? No. And Usagi says, so you deny it. Mamo's house is busy every time I call him. Then I heard a man's voice coming from this room. <sighs> Mamo-chan is so cruel talking with someone like Chibi Usa. <laughs> does does she think Chibi has a speakerphone? I don't know. That's what not she how thinks. phones work, yeah. Usagi. There is an intruder in your sister daughter's room. <laughs> if you hear a man's voice, that's what, it's like, well, that phone's loud. Yeah. Turn your phone down. What are you talking about? I don't about? think she even has a phone in her she room. Just... <laughs> She I has a I, Pegasus phone. That's right. It. Yes. I, it's a cordless. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you start, Usagi starts to crawl into the room and says, confess it. Chibi, thinking fast, says, wasn't today Mamo-chan's day to log onto the computer network? Wow. <sighs> I okay. feel old. You see, kids, uh, back in the olden days, your computer plugged into your phone line. Yeah. And you would call in with a modem to get our... <laughs> email or whatever it feels like i'm describing a telegraph or i know, you know? I it was know. only 20 years ago i know uh, usagi's like is it uh, 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 never mind and chibi says sheesh get out so i can go to sleep and usagi's like okay sorry and she leaves once she's gone chibi gets the pegasus phone back out and says oh pegasus you're a secret just between the two of us not this is creepy or weird at all. Literally what an abused person would say. Yes. Let's head somewhere less evil and troubling. The big top in the center of town. Where in the Hall of Mirror, Zirconia is having a conference with her dark queen through the two-way mirror. Mm -hmm. Queen Nehalania says, So, you still haven't found Pegasus. And Zirconia says, Well, the thing is, those little wenches weren't as useful as I thought. <laughs> great boss immediately <laughs> throws her employees under the bus yeah now Helenia says damn the sailor senshi all right prepare yourself for battle and don't repeat the same mistakes over and over zirconia happy to still have her head says 
Yes. In the Death Spa, Pala Pala, Jun Jun, and Siri Siri are relaxing in an oyster-shaped bathtub and looking at a picture of their next target. No guesses. Hiroki. June says, not too snappy a guy. <laughs> this is like <laughs> the first of many shots at this kid's I know. look. Yeah. We'll talk about it. And Siri grabs the picture and says, if you don't want to go, you don't have to. June says, well, I didn't say I wasn't going. And Pala says, Pala Pala wouldn't mind going. Siri says, okay, we'll, we'll Jan Ken Pone for it. But the picture is snatched away by the only Amazoness not in a bathing suit. Vess Vess. Yes. Who has just arrived. She says, too bad. I'm keeping this one. And June says, what, what was this decided? And Vess flips the picture over to show them a chibi drawing of her on the back. Yes. Not a chibi drawing, but like a cute, you know, ch- literal chibi drawing of Vess Vess on the back. Yes. Given the peace sign. Like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and Siri's like, what? When did you have the time to do that? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Yes, it is. A it raises question. a lot of questions. Yes. Vess says, well, enjoy your bath. And she leaves. And it makes me think of the fact that I, I know it's their character, so that's not a problem. But they don't, none of them want to do this. Yeah. They yeah, don't, no, they don't, they don't want to do, do it at all. And that's the problem of having a character who is like, we believe in nothing, man. Like, they don't, their, their thesis statement when they show up is like, we don't care. We like playing video games and shooting pool. Yeah. And we're we're bad girls. Right. And so why would we do a job? <laughs> like why would we <laughs> You've already shot yourself in the foot. And I was thinking, and I try not to because I get too sad, but I was thinking recently about the Amazon trio yeah. and how, yes, they started the day with, you know, a cocktail, a three martini breakfast. We've yeah. all been there. Right. But they're and then sometimes they fight over like who's gonna do what, but then they get it and they're like, All right, we're gonna do this. I'm ready. I got some great ideas. Yes. I'm motivated. And even when they are like, God, this woman's so boring. No, I will take her soul. (laughs) Like they had like a a work ethic. They did. You have to give them that. They had a work ethic. When your employee has a work ethic ethic like that, it's okay for them to drink at work. (laughs) Right? Um, It's like Mad Men. Sure. Those guys are drunk all the time at work. Well, that's true. But you know, okay. But they're going to close the deal. Sure, they're hard drinkers. Right. But they're good at what they do. Right. So, you know, you have that. With the Amazon S's, they're like, hey, I sure like this bath. I don't really want to. You Do you want to do this? I know. They like. So, it's like sometimes they fight over it and sometimes they're just like, dibs, not me. And they're not worried about being fired or hurt or destroyed by Zirconia. They're because not afraid we of her. see that, right, that their powers are equal to hers. Yes. Like Vespa's almost. What a great setup for a season! Vespa, I can't wait I to find out what's gonna happen. I know, like Vespa almost like hurts her, like yeah. in the very beginning when so, they show up. It it doesn't. There's nowhere for it to go. <laughs> Assuming it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. I'm just guessing it doesn't. Well, been the people. No, nobody ever says like, "Whew, that was a slog." But the ending of Super is whew. Nobody says that. They just say <laughs> Super is bad. So I can kind of guess what we're in for. Yeah, I know. The next day, Chibi goes back to the hill where Hiroki is working on the St. Louis. And she's got a little box with her. And she opens it up a crack. And we see the Pegasus phone inside. I know. It's like a sitcom. (laughs) Or no, he's like Senior Wences now, you know? Who? It's all right. All right. Thank you. Oh, okay. (laughs) It's all right. Chibi says, that's Hiroki's airplane. And Pegasus says, yeah, wow. He's doing it all by himself. Chibi says, Do you really want to see this or not? <laughs> Chibi says, he's really ambitious. And Usagi says, are you talking to yourself? Usagi's here. <laughs> and Chibi's like, Gah! and she slams the box shut and says, how'd you know where I was? And Usagi says, huh, don't underestimate the information net of your sister, Usagi. And we pan over to see Kaisuke and he's like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> My one man net. <laughs> With him are Momo and the squad. Because why not? Yeah, right. Ray says, that's a man-powered plane? It's not that kind of man-power, Ray. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Ray. It's rain and men. Oh, my God. And Kaiusuke says, it's just a bike. But Hiroki shouts over, it's an airplane. <laughs> and Kaiusuke's like, he's, he's got good ears. <laughs> the girls are all weirdly excited about this DIY plane. 
And it kind of reminds me of when, like, a sitcom gets some kind of cross-promotional special guest. Oh. And out of nowhere, everybody's like, hey, I can't wait to see that new Milton Berle special. (laughs) What? Do I smell cigar smoke and Grecian formula? (laughs) Milton Berle, what are you doing here? (laughs) Gotta get to see Milton Berle. Oh, my God. Right? Did they used to do that on yeah, sitcoms? Yeah, it's like you're like Roseanne, like season six or seven. You know, um, I don't know. Melissa Etheridge would show up or something. Okay, like sure, that be like, sure. Oh, did you get, give me my Melissa Etheridge album back. Oh, what are you talking about? Oh, I know you've had it for a long time. Like that. That's the first act, the first scene. Okay. And then later on, they go to the benefit or something, and like Melissa Etheridge is playing. And, and then, then the last, the... and the last button is like, I guess I'll give you girls both a CD. <laughs> <laughs> It happens all the time. Okay. Hiroki starts pedaling as the wind picks up, and he's off once again down the hill. And Chibi yells, hang in there, as the wheels of the bike begin to leave the hillside. But just as quickly, they fall back to earth. Mm-hmm. And Kayusuke yells, do your best, as Hiroki and the St. Louis leave the ground again and begin to soar over the canal. Until the wing tears away from the body of the bike, yes. and Hiroki and bike plunge once again into the frigid water. Later, on the bank of the waterway, Hiroki dries off in front of a fire. That's another law he must be breaking. Probably. You can't just light fires willy-nilly in the city. <laughs> That's a good in point. In Tokyo, a city made of wood? <laughs> Historically, I don't think so. Yeah, no. Chibi asks him, are you all right? But Hiroki is engrossed in his blueprint, wondering why his plane won't fly. Usagi snatches the plans out of his hand and gives it to Ami and says, uh-huh. okay, do the thing. Fix it. Smart now. <laughs> and Ami says, uh, it's amazing how far you've gotten all by yourself. But now her real talk. She's a little compliment uh-huh. over face sandwich. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, you need to generate more lift and strengthen the frames for the wings. <laughs> and Makoto says that, and he's a little out of shape. Wow, Makoto. There she goes. She has to put her two cents in. in. Yeah. Taco-chan. Taco-chan? Taco-chan sounds like Taco Bell's mascot in Japan. Like, hey, what's up? I'm (laughs) Taco-chan. Is that my lettuce? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, Makoto would totally get up at 3 a.m. For prayers and pumping iron like Mark Wahlberg, don't you think? Oh my God! <laughs> like, yes, I can actually imagine her doing that. Up in that. the morning, I got, I got to pray, pump, pump iron, and pray for God. Oh my God! You can pray for your God too. <laughs> anyway, Minako says Hiroki does have that feminine boy look. Okay, what? okay, we'll get to that in a bit, but we have to translation rewind, <laughs> yeah, just to see them sand the edges off of this. So in the Viz sub, available on YouTube, Makoto says, you lack stamina. And Minako says, your body looks soft, Hiroki. Which, let's face it, that strips like a metric ton of context out of what they're saying. You lack stamina. She says more words than that. Do you know what I mean? Like she talks for a while. It would take her longer to say something more than you lack stamina, you know? Yeah. So I don't think so. Yeah. OG sub for the win on this one. Okay. All right. So... Hiroki is a smaller guy, mm-hmm. if he's the same age as Chibi and Friends. Which, by the way, why is Kayusuke like 11 feet tall when they're nine? Great question. If especially anything, since boys Momo and Chibi should be to... getting taller than him yes. soon. So yeah. watch out. You do play a lot of three on three. <laughs> yeah, learn humans, artists. And speaking of artists, Hiroki is he's a more sensitive guy, uh-huh. I think. He's got longer hair. Mm-hmm. He's got... Uh, eucalyptus colored eyes. He wears a t-shirt that says LA. <laughs> is it really? He's not like the other boys. Uh-huh. Which is cool. Yeah. So back off, Minako. <laughs> I'm sure a tall, spiky-haired lacrosse player will be along for you anytime now. Oh, my God. Ray says, why don't you make it a two-seater? Oh, my God. Chibi's going to die. <laughs> oh, my God, no. <laughs> Usagi says, I'll do it. And Ray says, you're too heavy. Usagi says, you're a meanie. Chibi says, I'll do it. No. But this whole time, Hiroki has had this faraway look on his face. And he finally says, stop it. This is my dream and mine alone. Leave me alone. Kaisuke says, the reason you keep failing is because you say things like that. 
All men have the dream to fly in the skies, he says in a group of nine people where only three of them are men. <laughs> it's the first I've heard of this dream, but that's okay. Yeah. He says the Wright brothers were able to fly because they were brothers. There were two of them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> What the hell is he talking I about? I don't know. He said, I'm not good at uh, public speaking. He says, uh, you can rely on us, you know. And Hiroki immediately changes his mind and says, <laughs> thanks, Kayusuke. Turn this L.A. into an N.Y. <laughs> but Kayusuke says, don't thank me. Let's do it. And they shake hands. Makoto says, that's great. A friendship between guys. <sighs> Yeah. yeah, Sailor Snoopiter going on here. <laughs> what? Kaisuke and Hiroki start working on their plans, and Momo says, It's great to have a friend you can share things with. Oh, Momo, not you too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Chibi thinks, friendship, and looks down to her box where Pegasus is. Uh huh. Later, in another place, a fountain in the park. Uh huh. Near twilight, Chibi sits talking with Pegasus on the Pegasus phone, and she says, we're friends, right? And Pegasus says, Whoa, what's this friend stuff? Do you not like me? Oh my God. And Chibi says, I like you, Pegasus. I tell you everything about me, but I don't know anything about you. Uh, you said you had some puppies in your basement? Oh my God. Pegasus says, Sorry, I can't tell you that just now. <laughs> Gotta wait for the heat to die down. Uh, but I'm here in front of you. Isn't that enough? And Chibi says, if you are my friend, you can tell me anything. I won't testify. Oh, my God. But Pegasus says, if you can't believe in me, I can't be at your side. Jeez, what's a horse got to do to Svengali a kid these days? Oh, my God. I tell you. And the Pegasus phone turns to sparkles and disappears. Mm. Stop, don't come back. <laughs> Chibi says, Pegasus, wait, come back. Now that's an act break. Yeah. What a baby. She's upset. Pegasus. Oh, Pegasus. <laughs> You're not going to tell and let me keep my secrets. I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> it's a little withholding. It's a little, little bitch. She is. Oh, I'm going to take my horseshoes and go home. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you anything. I mean, she's not asking that much. She just wants to know like more about him. I'm using you <laughs> to hide from my enemies. Yeah, right. Exactly. What do you think you're going to... Bluff called, Pegasus. I'll see you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, what is the purpose of any of this? I, to upset And her? it's not like, also, I'm helping you stop bad guys who will presumably... I have no idea. This is so great. I have no idea if the Dead Moon Circus has any designs on the world. I understand that they need right. Pegasus for some reason. They want him for the power. But and then now I guess I guess we have kind of learned in her three appearances that Nehalenia has it in for the sailor soldiers. Yes. In some way. Yes. And so that could blow back onto our girls eventually. But at this point. Everybody's just, like, helping each other on spec here. Yep. We're all just trying to, like, pay it forward, and who knows how it's going to turn out. Yep. And then also you've squirreled three animal spirits away in your in your dark, yeah. dark kingdom for some reason. So we're all kind of <laughs> holding at least one card against our chest. Yes. But suddenly he's like, I'm out of here. It's like, okay, bluff call. I know. Let's see how the game gets played now. I know. You'll be back. <laughs> Leave a little bag of oats out. In front of the stable. <laughs> He'll be back. You watch. <laughs> Even later, Chibi stands alone on a footbridge, thinking about Pegasus and why oh, he's so darkness, secretive. Okay. Oh, <sighs> she wonders why he left and if they were really friends at all. No! <laughs> Mamoru arrives and says, Hey, Chibi Yusa, you're out pretty late. <laughs> At this point, it's like, where's your motorcycle? Like, oh, my God. Kids in this world are just, uh, let's go home. I'll walk you back. And they walk back through town. And as they pass Hayashita Boutique, Chibi says, Mamo-chan, have you ever gotten to an argument with Fusagi? <laughs> <laughs> and and Mamoru is like, uh, well, she got really mad once when I told her she couldn't eat a whole wedding cake. <laughs> and that we didn't know the people who were getting married. <laughs> But usually things go pretty well. And Chibi says, can you tell her anything that you're thinking? And he says, 
Well, we're at a point when we can say anything. As you know, Usagi's not somebody who can really hide things. And Chibi says, yes, you're more than just friends. I love where this is going. <laughs> but before I can go any farther, thank God, being a good mom for once, Usagi runs up. She's been looking for Chibi and she's ready to go home. Yep. But Chibi says, no. And Usagi says, what's wrong? And Chibi's like, you wouldn't understand anyway. You're always peeking into people's rooms, seeing how I'm doing, <laughs> and butting in. You're a real sailor snoopiter. <laughs> Usagi says, I just thought something was wrong. And Chibi says, well, forget it. There's just some things that I can't tell you. And she remembers Pegasus saying the same thing to her uh -huh. and her not accepting it. This is a terrible lesson, by the way. <laughs> it is. Because these two things are not. They're not the they same rhyme, thing. They but they're not the same thing. Yeah. Chibi is lost in her reverie. Blank look on her face. And Usagi looks at Mamoru like, is she okay? <laughs> <laughs> and Memorial gives her a nod and she says okay well I'll go on ahead <laughs> and she leaves the two of them yeah actually she just walks into like an alley it looks like she like, just goes into an alley just right there yeah which is weird it is weird we hear the sound of a dumpster opening and someone <laughs> getting inside <laughs> and the door closing oh my god <laughs> the next day at the hill Chibi sits lost in thought as Hiroki puts the finishing touches on the St. Louis Mark II now with two seats mm -hmm. and two sets of pedals. Yep. Is there, is there a bad guy in this show? Is there um, a villain? Well, I think I think so. Bad guy's going to show up anytime soon? Probably. <laughs> We're getting pretty near the end here. Yeah, I know we are. He says, I used the advice that Ami and everyone gave me. It really is a good feeling to have friends. Yeah, friends make you feel fantastic. You can tell them anything. And if they don't want to tell you something, you accept it. Ah, friends. Oh the best. <laughs> and we go inside Chibi's head when she is just beast mode, hello darknessing. And she remembers Pegasus saying, believe in me. She puts her head in her hands and says, I'm so sorry, Pegasus. And Hiroki is like, Hey, I'm a feminine boy, so I can tell that something's wrong. Oh, my God. Does your stomach hurt? Y yeah. I don't know why you immediately went to <laughs> is that. It, is it cramps? Oh, my, uh, oh my God. Chibi's like, no, I'm fine. The show must go on. <laughs> Hiroki says, we'll for sure fly today. And a voice says, long ago, man looked up to the skies. Oh my god. Hiroki looks up and sees Ves Ves dressed up like an aviatrix. She looks like Amelia Earhart exactly. or something. Yes. Yeah. And balancing in midair on her red ball. Yes. Hey, Pala Pala's the ball balancer. Yeah. Stick to your gimmick. <laughs> Want her to come down where you work and knock the whip out of your hands? <laughs> she says, to make such a thing, to fly in the sky. I can fly anytime I like. Hiroki is into this, I think. <laughs> but Chibi's like, hey, who are you? And Vess says, I'm just another person who loves the skies. I'm nobody suspicious. And Chibi's like, tell your outfit. <laughs> Vess says, I'm not dressed like an ordinary girl. And Hiroki and Chibi are like, no, you're not. <laughs> and Vess goes all anime girl. She's like, oh, wow, Kakui, I want to be your friend. It doesn't come off like that. And they're like, no, it doesn't. And Vess is like, I thought I had a good disguise. You guys are sharp. And Chibi says, anybody floating in midair is suspicious. <laughs> Vess says, well, I've got no choice if you found me out. And she flips upside down on her ball. And when she's upright again, she's in her circus togs. She says, now I'll take a look at your dream mirror. Colliding ball! And she shoots the cue at the kids as Hiroki pushes Chibi out of the way. Chibi rolls down the hill. Mm -hmm. The ball hits the ground behind him, bounces back, and Hiroki gets his mirror knocked out. Yep. But sorry, Charlie, it's not a golden mirror. Sign away, Charlie. We got nothing to lose. And I feel like they really stretched it out, too. This mirror spins for a while. <laughs> and people were like, huh? Huh? Ooh, no dice. Yeah. So I don't know if they're a little short. This 
week or what? Maybe they were. It doesn't feel, when they get into the body of the episode, it feels long. People are talking, things yes. are happening, but there's a couple spots where they're like, just a couple more frames. Just Got it. add the padding. Yeah. Vess says, another false alarm? I wasted my time holding on to that pick. I think Zirconia has gone senile, but she doesn't have to clean up a mess like this. But we hear, hold it right there! Right in the middle of adolescence, climbing up into the skies, I can't forgive you for taking Hiroki's wings from his heart! <laughs> and we see Sailor Chibi Moon running up the hill, just running up that hill. Yes. Towards Vess. She finally gets there, and she's like, And Vess is like, oh, is it just you today? <laughs> Chibi says, in the name of the moon, I'll punish you. Vess says, I didn't ask you that. Are you alone? And Chibi says, I can take you myself. And she pulls out her carillon. Vess says, what is that? And the thing that Chibi seems to have expected to happen is not happening. Mm -hmm. So she just shoots her with little pink bits of energy. Yep. You get the pink sugar attack bit. Bring that back. Yeah, right, exactly. Vess is like, knock it off. Come forth, my lemur, dream eating mammoth, pow pow musume. And out of her shadow comes, well, a uh, purple faced and gray skinned lady in an elephant themed dress. Yes. And by elephant themed, I don't mean a print. I mean it has a trunk and tusks attached to the front. Yes. And it is draped to suggest elephant ears. And a mouth. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool, actually. It is kind of cool. Pow Pow flips her little wings out, and she dives at Chibi Moon. And as she flies, she drags her trunk across the ground, cutting a huge furrow in the hill. Yes. Chibi dives out of the way, and Vess Vess says, Pow Pow's power is of mammoth proportions. Oh, my God. All right. She's got, got some patter here. Yeah. Chibi looks at the new ditch in the hill like, Yoip! And Vess Vess says, Pow Pow, go ahead and eat that mirror. And Pow Pow flies close to Hiroki's mirror. And as its body mouth opens wide, a red rose sinks into the ground, signaling that Tuxedo Mask is here. Mm -hmm. And so are the Sailor Senshi. Yes. Because why not? <laughs> Sailor Moon winks and says, no need to take them alone. Leave them to us. And Vest Vest says, Pow Pow, get rid of them all. And Pow Pow says, Pow. <laughs> but guess what? Mars Flame Sniper, that's what. And Mercury Alpha Rhapsody, we get a water-wreathed flame arrow that sends the baddies scattering. TM says, now Chibi Moon. And Chibi raises her carillon. But remembers that Pegasus is being a little snot and has disappeared. <laughs> Chibi <laughs> contemplates not being able to end this fight. And she says, um, I can't. Pegasus won't come here anymore. I'm not worthy of calling on him. Vess and Power are watching this, and Vess says, I don't know what's going on, but this is our chance. And Pow goes flying straight for Chibi, and Sailor Moon pushes her out of the way at the exact last second. Moon has hurt her arm where they fell, mm -hmm. but she gets up and says, This this is nothing. Chibi, listen, I don't know what happened, but you have to believe in yourself more than that, because we love you, Chibi. Chibi remembers Pegasus telling her to believe in him. And she says, thanks, Sailor Moon, and sorry about yesterday, and all is well. Vess yells, come on, Pow Pow, close the deal! And as Pow flies once again towards them, Chibi again raises her carillon, and with a twinkle yell, she summons Pegasus! Pegasus appears and says, hey, everyone, I'm back! I'm never going to leave. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey, tell Milton Burl I got that 20 bucks I owe him. <laughs> I owe me. <laughs> Sailor Moon gives with the MGM and Pow Pow stages out for the last time. Vess says, uh, you'll get what's coming to you. And she quickly balls out. As the Senshi contemplate Pegasus in the sky, Chibi says, you came for me. And Pegasus says, as long as you believe in your dreams, I'm always at your side. Oh, are those sirens? I gotta go. Oh, my God. <laughs> Later on the hill, Hiroki and Kaiosuke are ready to test the SL2 as the squad cheers them on. They barrel down the embankment, pedaling furiously, and as they reach the river's edge, they soar off into the sky. Chibi thinks, they're flying. The power to believe in something is so cool. And she remembers the words of Pegasus. As long as you believe in your dreams, I'm always at your side. 
Who are those sirens? Hey, I gotta go. <laughs> she thinks, I believe in you too, Pegasus, because the power to believe can create a wonderful miracle. And back in Chibi's room, we see the Pegasus phone has returned. <laughs> God. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so is her dream having friends or having a special friend? We make fun of Pegasus for being a little snot, but it's possible that at that point she was disillusioned in the idea of friendship. And so her, let me try to get through this. Yeah. Her dream soil, you know, her oh dream God. environment was sort of spoiled. And so he, he literally could not be there. He had to sort of leave because he needs to be, he's like a, I would argue Peter Pan is already predatory, but a predatory Peter Pan figure where he's like, you have to be pure and innocent so I can live yeah. in you. And yeah. at that point, she's, you know, at a crossroads. It's like the kid whose dream was soiled last week. Yeah, right. So bad that a, a plant dirt pot wouldn't eat it. <laughs> you know? I know. I so know. maybe it's a situation where she's like, she's not, she's soiled on, soiled. She's spoiled is the word I meant. Although, you know, I guess if the soiled, pot spoiled. fits. Yeah. Uh, and so she was spoiled on the idea of friendship or belief in it. And it's like, oh, now I can't be here anymore. Here, here's the thing. Yes. There has been, and I have complained about this over the course of 150 episodes, um, intermittent um, references to the idea of a girl's purity and her worth. Yes. Yes, that's very true. Being tied to her purity. Yeah. They have now literalized that within the narrative. <laughs> if If... My interpretation of this is the correct interpretation. And I don't, I don't know, but I don't. As I, long as you're a, a pretty little innocent girl, that's when I can get in there. You, do you know what I'm saying? It, I do think that that's like what that it is. To me. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. We agree. Yeah. We agree. It's terrible. It, it is terrible. I mean, I don't think he, <sighs> he has to be in somebody who's has He's a not a new Usagi. No, he has to be in somebody who has a beautiful dream who's innocent, probably, too. He's not in Mamoru. No. Although it might work out because Mamoru talks to himself anyway, we've learned. And so <laughs> we'll just add another voice to the chorus. Okay. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think he... He's not in a me. He tried to go in there and he's like, oh, oh, oh my God. This is like an S&M dungeon in here. Oh, my God. I gotta no. get out of here. <laughs> Poor me. Oh. Why couldn't last year we had ray was kind of you know a a focus yes you know that's true a, a node of the storytelling uh focus yes w why obviously you know we want to make a chibi she's the main character um i used to say jokingly now i say it for real I, what could have been one of the other girls it, it could have been, been on me because yeah. our little secret horn dog, that's our theory. I don't know if anything really backs that up. Yeah, I don't know if anything really backs that up As somebody either. who's really, you know, pure, presumably. Yeah. Um, it could have been her. Yeah. And then it wouldn't be quite so weird. It would be less weird than what it is right now. Actually, he'd just be, <laughs> if he was inside on me's head, it would just be like that, uh, you know, the hangover. It's just all like equations. But he's like, this is, well, it's really exciting in here. Can I get a beer or something? Yeah, Pegasus probably right. wouldn't wouldn't be as happy about wow. it. Wow. <laughs> just rulers and uh, compasses. Math equations. <laughs> I found Hiroki to be rather annoying. Um, and I felt bad about it, but. He feels, this is, remember, I'm writing this now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know. I want writing credit for this. Call the guild. Uh, it feels like he is has been abused or has been hurt friend wise. Okay, I guess because his see response that. to people showing him interest, and interest, help. affection, and assistance is in knee jerk immediate. Yeah. And it would make sense if we learned something about him that opened that up to us, but we don't. And he just goes, 
Oh, you just said it again, but more forcefully the second time. And now I'm on board. I know. I know. Yeah. I, that bothers me. Yeah. And this show has, sometimes they dig a little too far into like, oh, and then I was 1935, you know, flashbacks. But like, it's done that before. Yeah. But this one, they're like, don't worry about it. No, we don't. We don't really learn that much about him don't need to worry at about all. It. We just. He thought it was a bad idea. Yeah. Now he thinks it's a good idea. <laughs> I know. And then, like, when we first see him, he's destroying public property, too, for his dream. And yeah. apparently also building little fires. Yeah. Little fires everywhere. Yeah. Um, And then, and this is a modern reading, but, you know, it, I, it look, straights come in all shapes and sizes. But is it possible that he's not straight? It's possible. That's what we're suggesting. I don't know if we're suggesting that. In our that. backwards sort of 90s way. He's a little different. Possibly. And then Jeebie's like, well, we'll help you. Boy, I sure think you're cool. He's like, whatever. I don't... What? <laughs> <laughs> Not interested. You know what I mean? Not yeah, at all. Yeah. Moving on. I I mean, it's possible that that's what they're suggesting. Um. I mean, what... A- <sighs> I don't know. Like the answer is no. No. We well, are like how many other characters are not explicitly, you know, uh, heterosexual in the show, and it's like two. Pretty much. And then there's a couple other that we that uh, are gray. Yeah, that you know you you sort of retcon or or just in, choose to interpret as yes um, something or other. Um, but I don't know. I just thought like I'm just trying to give this kid some depth. Period. <sighs> Well then, let's say let's say that was their. Intention. I mean, his shirt said L.A., not S.F. <laughs> Clearly, not not as not as hardcore. Let's say yes, just to give him some character. Depth. <laughs> okay, all right. So we rewrite that part. Yeah. Uh, we cut out the uh, the padding of uh, the extra frames in some of these scenes. Yes. Right. Uh, we try to give some kind of background to why she shows up. As Amelia Earhart, I have it no feels idea. Uh, again. It's one of those things where it's like, is the sort of Japanese sense of timing a little different than the Western one? Because ultimately, it seemed to me like the payoff is she's quibbling over her costume and like, oh, I love flying, don't you? And all these things. When in truth, she's a woman who is just. Oh, hovering in the air yes. like a ghost yes, <laughs> or like an alien. Right. She doesn't understand that it doesn't matter what she does. What doesn't she's matter. wearing. Yes. How, how NPC she looks. Yeah. She's literally floating in the air. But <laughs> that's like what she doesn't get. She's yeah. like, oh, you can't do this. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I actually thought that part was pretty funny. Um, yeah. But I then later she, she was like, oh, I'll get you. And she's like, oh, is it just you? No, no, really. Is it, is it like just you? Is she like excited to get one of them alone or something? So I feel like she's excited that it's just one because she thinks Nalania she can win. Hates the sailor soldiers. Zirconia is just middle management. She's just trying to yes. meet, meet her targets for this quarter. Yes. And then the employees don't care at all. So none of that hate is is moving to the. You're right. To the organs of the or, uh, organization who are going to do things. That's true. It isn't like. Divide and conquer. Kill these bitches. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. It's just like, and I would just like for once to see the bad guys kind of figure that out and go, you know, sometimes we get like, we got like, oh, um, go after Ami. She's the impressionable one. And so we give her a fantasy where the sailors hate her or something like yes, that. Yes, right. But I like to see like, no, oh, we got to divide, c- c- conquer, take these guys out. Chris Claremont. Yes. In his legendary run, his 17-year run on the Mm X-Men, had a storyline about the Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club, a dangerous society of mutants who are power brokers and wear underwear instead of clothes. (laughs) Yeah. And they know the X-Men are dangerous and they 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 can stop them in their designs. And so they turn to the mastermind. Okay. Jason Wingard. And they say, Jean Grey is the most powerful member of the X-Men. But Cyclops is in love with her. Wolverine's in love with her. Everybody likes her. If you can take her out, if you can compromise her, Uh not only will we gain an ally, but it will tear the team apart. 
Sure. And that's exactly what he does by putting her into a fantasy where she believes that she's in love with him and she becomes the Hellfire Club's black queen. Oh my gosh. And that's when they divide and conquer and take out the X-Men. And then Wolverine gets knocked through three floors of the building and ends up in the sewer. The X-Men are captured. But Wolverine pops out of the water and says, you took your best shot, bub. Now it's my turn. (laughs) I'm a little off topic, but the point is, it's like, I'd love to see it treated like that and not like, here are five dolls. Come on, girls, buy these dolls. (laughs) Same animation every time. Oh, my God. I don't know what happens in the manga, Um, but just looking at it a little more like, and weirdly, that's kind of what the live action show did, didn't it? What do you mean? They all got their own thing. They had storylines that had nothing to do with Usagi. They did. They, there was the possibility of them like quitting or like doing other things. Yes. We even get the flash forward, you know, with the movie or the last episodes. Yes. Where... They have kind of very different destinies and have kind of done different stuff. You literally get a Jason Wingard situation, which I never realized before. Whoever wrote the live action oh, show yeah. likes the X-Men, huh? Yeah, because you're right. Because they literally like dark, Black Queened Dark Mercury. Yeah, they did. They totally <laughs> did. That's why you tune into this show. <laughs> to get insights about... 20-year-old Japanese live-action TV shows and 40-year-old comic books. (laughs) Just keeping it topical, that's all. (laughs) All of you relax. This is a matter of inconvenient timing, that's all. Rebooting the podcast was inevitable. This is simply the beginning. I thought I told all of you I want broadcast silence until further. Ooh, I'm very sorry, Cal. I didn't get that message. Maybe you should have put it on Twitter. I figured since you were relaunching the Just Enough Trope podcast, you might be a little lonely, so I decided to be your co-host. Uh, that's very kind of you. I assume you're our mysterious podcaster. You're most troublesome for a Sailor Moon fan. <clears throat> sorry, Cal. Wrong guess. Would you like to go for an all-new show where the hosts haven't really changed? Who are you, then? Just a fly in the ointment, Cal. The die in the hard. The moon in the lighting. She's talking about the rebooted Just Enough trope, where we'll dive deep into the pop culture elements that make up your favorite movies, TV shows, comics, and video games. See if she's lying about moonlighting and find out if Bruno has returned. No, no, no. Respect yourself. Miss Mystery Guest, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Unless you want to sing a duet with me. Uh, no, I'm afraid not. But you have me at a loss. You know my name, but who are you? Just another podcast host who saw too many movies as a child? Another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks she's John McClane? Corbin Dallas? A crooning Alcapop pitchman? I was always kind of partial to Seagram's golden wine cooler, actually. It's wet and it's dry! Do you really think you have a chance with this new show, Ms. Co-host? Yippee-ki-yay, mother cooler. Just Enough Trope, 40 stories of sheer pop culture deconstruction. Available everywhere you listen to your favorite shows. Do I sound like I'm ordering a podcast? Today for Kuro Kuro Miru, or Curiously Looking Around, where we talk about elements of Japanese culture within the episode, we're going to be talking about bicycles or jitensha in Japan. Jitensha? Yeah. That Interesting. Is, that is how you say bicycle. G- uh, jitensha. Yes. Um, it is unclear exactly when the bicycle first came to Japan or how it got there. Um, it did come I'm over. I'm going to guess <laughs> how it got there. Come on, you can't set me up like that. I mean, I guess... <laughs> It didn't like fly itself over the ocean in in well, land okay, into right, Japan. Well, okay, all right, all right. But I mean, yeah, on two I'm, wheels. That's how it got there. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> fair. Also, by cutting off a rickshaw. I mean, you asshole. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, it it did come over sometime during That's the. A joke Edo- about driving. I know, and rickshaws rickshaws were actually a, I believe a Japanese in bikes. invention. Yes. I believe in bike lanes. Yes. But man, some some bicyclists. Drive like their cars. They do. And they just expect you to get out of their way. I know. it's It can be really annoying. But um, the bicycles came over sometime during the Edo period, which was 1603 to 1868. 
The first bikes that came over were um, Ordinaries or Penny Farthings on the bikes with the one large front wheel and one small back wheel. From information with that has some dates on it, the Ordinary was popular in Japan from 1885 to 1895. The first bikes were rather expensive and thus were kind of a status symbol. Um, you can see ordinaries depicted in Japanese art of the time, both ukiyo-e and other styles. Uh, in 1988, the Sankai newspaper had the headline, Kutomo Gunsmith Makes Early Bicycle. This bicycle was found with an old and prominent family of Shizuoka Prefecture, the manufacturer year, and the... Um, Next revelations were especially important as the year and manufacturer of the place and construction were marked on the frame, April of Meiji 24, which means it was 1891. Um, this identifies the place and manufacturer of Kuntimo, which today is Nagahamashi. Huh. Um, this is right around the time that bicycles are becoming very popular. They're becoming more popular. Because, yeah. like you said, they've existed for a long time. A, yes. A two-wheeled vehicles. Yes. But after the Industrial Revolution, it became cheaper and more efficient to produce a lot of them. Yeah. And so, you know, the end of the 19th century, suddenly it's, like, oh, you can get around for fast and, you know, on your own two feet and terrorize pedestrians and yeah right <laughs> it became very popular it did uh four young men who attended the imperial university started what may have been the first bicycle club in japan in 1886 the club members all raised money and purchased one bicycle to share and they used the <laughs> bicycle mainly to exercise what yeah so Did they put it up on blocks or like <laughs> No, I mean I think they, they, they saw it as like a means of getting exercise. So I'm sure they went about town and everything too. They didn't just have it in place or anything like that. Sure. Um yeah, let's put up some blocks and just have this in one the first electric bike. <laughs> the first sitcom gag. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um Thomas Stevens, an Englishman, was the first person to, to circle the globe by bicycle. Huh. He rode a large-wheeled ordinary, also known as a penny farthing, from April 1884 to December 1886. In 1886, he arrived in Nagasaki, Japan, via ship. He rode his bicycle towards Kobe. Um, okay. The bicycle part of his journey around the world ends on the 17th of December 1886 at Yokohama. His itinerary accounts, quote, distance actually wheeled about 13,500 miles. Uh, Stevens returned by streamer to San Francisco in January 1887. Uh, his travels through Japan were reported in the Gigi Shinpo newspaper, and the story was quite popular and helped to popularize the penny farthing. Well, Even depend, more. Was that like early in his journey or later? It was. It was. It was later in his journey. Like okay. I, that was the end of his journey. Yeah. Like he. he if you've went, already been through the Alps and stuff like that, then you get to Japan. You're like, okay, okay, I, I got this. Yeah, he went because the mountains can pick up really fast. In yeah, Japan. he went through Europe, and I think he went through India and um, Hong Kong as well. Yeah. Um, like start in Florida. Right. Then get to the Appalachians. I think he started in the United States. Then get to the Rockies. Yeah. Yeah. But if you start off, you know, in, in the Alps, you're like. <laughs> it, it, everything looks up from there. <laughs> yeah. And I think it would be that much harder to ride, like, one of those bikes, like, all around the world and everything. You know what I mean? Yes. It's, it's a lot. Yes. Um, when was the first time that. We, we we didn't have enough to do. <laughs> we didn't have enough to do. Do you know what, what I'm saying? No, I don't. You're like, uh, oh, how many of us can we fit in this phone booth? It's 1950. Oh, I'm in okay. college, right? Okay. But like in 1880 something, this guy's like, I'm gonna ride a bike all over the world. Yeah. And hold on, the front wheel of the bike, huge. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. I know. I, mean, I know. It, this is not a Cannondale. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is not... These things probably do not go that fast. No, I don't think they do. And I don't... It doesn't have adjustable gears. I don't think that they did. Right? I, I can't so imagine them make, having I mean, the gears. big wheel... The, the reason for the big wheel is that's your motive wheel. 
the bigger it is, the more kind of distance you're covering, right? Yeah, Other right. Other than a small wheel has to go around many times, big wheel goes around less times and you right. travel the same distance, right? Yeah. So that's why it's big. Before they came up with the variable changeable gear that yes. allowed you to do the essentially the same thing with the same size wheel. Right. So he's just like, just pumping it. Was he alone? He was alone. Yeah. So Okay. So wait a minute. Maybe he just went like boat to boat. He's like, oh, whoosh, whoosh. I mean, I guess that's possible. Stick a bunch of birds on his pants. <laughs> oh, oh what, a, what a journey. <laughs> I guess that's possible. We're taking but his be... word for this? Yeah, I think we are. All right. <laughs> Um, the bicycle was adopted early on for both the post office and the army in Japan. The bicycle for the post office was first primarily used for telegrams. Uh, bicycles are widely utilized in Japan by people of all ages and social classes. Rental bicycles are also prevalent and available for tourists or anyone who wants to rent a bike for the day. Although bicycles were introduced in Japan in the late Edo period, it was not it wasn't socially acceptable for women to ride bicycles until nearly a century later. Uh, since bicycle, oh, are you sure? Yeah, in Japan. In Japan, yes. That was uh, the Velocipedians was a real problem in the late uh, 19th century in New York. Yeah. Sure, you got this nice big park. Uh huh. No, right in the yeah. middle of town. Yeah. And all these women sit in side saddle with their bustles sticking out. <laughs> Tearing through the park <laughs> yes. on their velocipedes. Yes. I'm writing a letter to the editor. I can't wait for that scene in the Gilded Age. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> I'll look forward to that. Um, since bicycles were intended for men, they used to be heavy, large, and relatively expensive. Men hate expensive uh, things. Yeah, well. <laughs> uh, in the 1950s, bicycle manufacturers needed to pivot as the demand for traditional bicycles diminished. Finally, it was time for a bicycle to be designed for the needs of a woman. Uh, finally. Uh, the most prevalent bicycle type in Japan. The streamers were being Oh, my God. Designed. Come on. <laughs> Baskets were tested. Yes. Okay. All right. And uh, uh, crotch bars were uh, uh, cut off. That's right. Uh, the most prevalent bicycles type in Japan and at rental shops are simple bicycles for everyday use called Mama Chari or Mama's Chariot. That's what it was shortened from. Uh, Mama Chari usually come with a basket and or a child seat, a kickstand, a simple lock, and just one gear. Mama Chari are also available with up to six gears. So you can get pay a little extra and get six gears. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Uh, Mamachari Deluxe. That's right. The lightweight frame and low center of gravity of the ma Mamachari bicycles uh, make make it a piece of cake for uh, women to hop on and off, as well as uh, ride stability, even when children or groceries piled onto the front and the back. The first Mamachari mo models were really a means to empower women with their daily lives because they can get around quick and easy with babies and groceries this is your chari yeah mama, mama chari <laughs> today the mama chari is used by many different kinds of folks not just mamas and it is also known as a shopping bicycle while much more costly some people prefer to buy electric mama chari to help them climb hills in their neighborhood or give them that extra power thrust to ferry their kids to and fro if you're looking to ride longer distances, explore Japan's famed cycling roads, or to stay in shape, then the cross bike, or kuro, kurosu baiku, hmm. or road bike, rodo baiku, would be suitable. They are built to speed and are notably lighter than the mamachari due to the materials utilized in their frames. Huh. Uh, for those wishing to make one's way across Japan's many mountain bike trails, you'll need a mountain bike or mountain mount, mountain biku. Mountain biku. Uh, while most road bikes are built with, for smoother roads, mountain bikes are built to go off the beaten track, obviously. Um, if you live in the Japanese countryside and happen to pass by an unpaved or, or gravel roads daily, it's worth putting money into a mountain biku. Um, while small towns and city outskirts will typically have perfectly fine roads for getting 
around during errands, it's important to be conscientious of different terrain or bad weather you might encounter. Like if you have a gravel road, you know, maybe it'll get muddy or yeah. something like that. And then you'll have to deal with that on your bike. Yeah. And you need to have something that can go through that. Um, trying to ride through snow is also incredibly hard. <laughs> Uh, anyways, bicycles in Japan are classified as light vehicles along with motor scooters, which means you need to follow all traffic laws when you're on a bike. That means you should also be riding your bike on the street with cars. Uh, Japanese bicycle laws are kind of fast and loose. Uh. If you use common sense and are careful, you should be okay. Um, in the event that it's, quote unquote, too dangerous to ride on the street, anyone can ride on the sidewalk. And the, the truth to be the matter is I rode on the sidewalk a lot when I was in Japan. <laughs> like, I did not know this was not a thing you weren't did you supposed to do. learned a lot of Japanese curse words? <laughs> Though there were, there, were, there were other people, there are Japanese kids riding on the, the sidewalks too. So I don't know how much this is all enforced. But um, almost nobody follows the rule that bikes should be ridden on the road. Um According to a government survey, 40% of the public is not aware that bicycles are meant to be ridden on roadways. Um, the other 60% largely don't follow this rule either. Most people ride their bicycles on the sidewalk and the police turn a blind eye. Uh, in the big city, riding on the sidewalk makes a lot more sense in Japan because cars don't really look out for bikes that much, which would be a problem. You could get into an accident pretty easily. But, like, there aren't as many cars, though. There aren't, but there are more cars than maybe you would think. Oh. Um, there, I mean, there definitely aren't as many cars, but there are still plenty of cars um, on the roads, I think. Okay. Um, many people still don't lock their bikes up. This typically is not an issue. Most people, however... Do lock their bikes using little locks that are built into the wheel. The locks make it so um, so no one can um, roll the rear tire, basically. It right. clamps it up. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean, like, somebody could literally pick up your bike and walk away with it. <laughs> okay. Um, but, yeah. Um, usually, there will be a designated place to park your bike. It's If it's super rural, you kind of just put it off to the side somewhere where it's not going to be uh, in anyone's way. If you're in the city, you need to make sure that you are parking your bike in a dedicated uh, bike parking area. Uh -huh. um, they have a lot of places have places where you can uh, park your bike by the train station in particular. That's very popular. Yeah. Um, some are free and open air. And then the ones that are covered are you have to pay. But it's it's like. Not a whole lot to just keep your, your bike there. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to just park your bike anywhere because um, the police could take your bike and fine you for that. So <laughs> you don't want to do that. Like if you see like a lamp, uh, like a lamp post or something like that or a sign or whatever, you shouldn't just like lock your bike up right there and be like, oh, I'm going to go shopping. <laughs> so, yeah, don't do that. Um, most bikes in Japan have bells on them. Make sure you use your bell if you need to pass someone, especially if you are riding on the sidewalk. Um, if you're walking and hear a bell, as a general rule, move to the left. Um, you can't bring your bike on the train. The, there is an exception to this rule, though. If you have a folding bike and it has a bag, you can bring it on the train. This essentially makes it luggage. Um, so... The only time you couldn't do that is during rush hour because there no big bags are allowed during rush hour. Oh yeah, which makes sense. I can't even imagine how you get a bike on a Japanese train. It's not only like here it's where folded. it's like oh, there's entire areas where you hang your bike up on, right. a, on a, an American you know tram or train or something right. like that. But like yeah, yeah, I know there it just it must fold fit. up pretty small. Yeah. Um. Children under 13 are supposed to wear a helmet, although this is not enforced. Um, there is no law that adults should wear helmets, so most do not. When you buy a new bicycle, the shop will help you do that. If you buy a used bike, you want to do that through the police and make sure that it's registered. This will um, help you track it down if it gets stolen. 
if you give a ride to someone else on your bike or or there are two people on the bike, that can be a 20,000 yen fine or $132.89 USD. Uh, you can get up to three months in prison or a, a 50,000 yen or around $300 fine for using an umbrella or a cell phone while riding. Okay. But both are very common, especially holding an umbrella while riding. Um, you cannot ride your bike on pedestrian crosswalks. You should walk your bike if you're going through a pedestrian crosswalk. Um, so if Shibuya Crossing, you got your bike, yeah. you, you have to walk it. Uh, riding a bicycle while drunk can get you five years in prison oh plus, oh plus a one million yen or $6,647 USD fine. However, there are lots of drunk salarymen on bikes, like a lot. You see that a lot, apparently. <laughs> so what are you in for? Yeah, <laughs> I well, rode I a bike got drunk. really mad. I took a bike and I, I rode it on the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, riding while listening to music on headphones can also get you a 50,000 yen uh, fine. Damn. Um, in 2010, 658 people died in Japan due to accidents involving bicycles. This is similar to America's bicycle fatality rate of 618 in 2010. However, most likely more people in Japan ride bikes than in America. Yeah. So you even though the fatality numbers are similar, it's this is like a completely different, you know, it doesn't show like how many people out of all the people who ride a bikes were were uh yeah killed. Yeah. So Okay. Yeah. Uh when I was in Japan in college, the school that I I went to lent all of the fifty or so students, um, lent us all bikes. Um, and I remember like the first day they, or the second day they, you know, everybody had a bike assigned to them and we, and you had to wear a helmet. Um, that was their, their rule. You had to wear a helmet when you're riding their bikes. And they took us into town, uh, which was like 10, 15 minutes away and showed us where the grocery store was, the train station, that sort of thing. Um, and then we biked back together in a big group, hmm. but I am pretty sure they were mama Chari and had a bell on a basket up front. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned the rule about helmets. Well, one girl didn't want to wear a helmet because Ooh. it would ruin her hair. <laughs> and so she just didn't wear a helmet a couple of times and she got in trouble for that with the school. And she was like, screw this. And she bought her own bike. And so it's just so she didn't have to wear a helmet. <laughs> I was like, okay. <clears throat> Perfect. Yeah. Um, I had a a rain jacket and rain pants that I wore when I had to bike in the rain, uh, and they helped keep you dry-ish, but you still, like, when you got home, you're just still, like, drenched and, like, have, I mean, your feet are soaked. Yeah. Um, and so you just had to take a shower to warm up when you got back. So I get, I get the umbrella thing, but it's, it's much safer to have, um, a raincoat that has a hood. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> itadakimasu with usagi. What did usagi eat in this episode? Oddly, no food in this episode. Yeah. So, um, you know, no time to eat. I guess so. You got to, you know, build your bike plane. Bike plane. Also, when your lunchbox has Pegasus in it, I mean, there's no room for food anyway. <laughs> there you go. It was her lunchbox. There you go. That's one thing. Bill and Gage, where you rate a baddie one to five dark stars, five being the most wicked. The lemur in this episode is named Pao Pao Musume, the dream, the dream eating mammoth. So her name comes from Pao, which is the sound an elephant makes. Pao, Pao. Pao. Elephants are always going Pao, Pao. Yeah, I, I know they always do that, the Pao, Pao sound. Like it's footfalls? Maybe. Because an elephant goes. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Neither of us make the elephant sound championships. Tell you that. No, we do not. Uh, pow pow. It, it it sounds more like a trumpet. That boom boom pow. Yeah, boom boom pow. Um. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I'll take your word for it, Japan. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Uh, so she has a pink face, and her body is a humanoid purple elephant. Her chest has the face 
of an elephant, tusks and all. Huh. The purple elephant is a dress with a slit up her left leg. Mm. The inside is lined with pink. And the top of her dress or the top of the elephant's head is a red diamond and green um, embellishment. Yeah. And this matches the ball on top of Pow Pow's head. <laughs> yeah. She is. Remember when we had, like, it was one of the ball um, family, and it, we thought it was, like, on top of an elephant, and we thought it was going to be the elephant, but it was actually the ball? Yes. So. This is, like. This uh, is the opposite. Right. I'm going to fly, so we'll put the ball on my head. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, an elephant with a ball. <laughs> it's on my head. Um, the, so, um, the elephant's ears are also purple lined with pink. Her arms and her legs are gray with large swirls on her knees and elbows. Yeah. Her fingers are red and she has dark hair and a gold banded necklace. And she says, pow, pow, girl's power is mammoth as well. <laughs> so there you go. Um, I So her, her design is unsettling because, again, there is like a second face on her abdomen. Um, but it is kind of cool that it's like kind of a slinky dress as well. Um, and I do like the ears. I read in one of the Sailor Moon wikis that like her wings, her her ears are used like wings, which might be a reference to Dumbo, which I don't know if that's really what it is, or they just thought it was cool, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, I could I could see that. Uh, you know, having a, a flying elephant is, is probably a, more of a reference to Dumbo than anything else. Yeah, I suppose. And then once you have an elephant in the air, it's like, well, what part of him is like a wing? Oh, it's their ear. So it could be convergent evolution. Yeah. Or it could be a reference. Well, and I guess, too, we, we have in the episode, he's trying to fly. So then you have a, a baddie who comes after you who flies. Yeah. I mean, that just kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um, Pao Pao Musume creates a huge divot in the ground with her trunk as she tries to attack or scare Chibiusa, and she goes after her a couple more times. Um, we just don't get to see that much of her, so I'm I'm gonna give her three out of five dark stars. Yeah, um, I'm gonna give her four. Okay. I I think that this is um you know this is a solid design. Uh, she's maybe a little over accessorized yeah. as a woman. Uh, but they are women first and they are monsters second. We know this. And I like the fact that this is, you know, a scary lady in a dress, but it's also they found every way they could to get elephant in there mm -hmm. from the dress to her rubbery gray flesh yes. on her arms and legs yes. with the little curly cues yes. at the joints. Uh, I thought that that was really strong. Um, and I don't really understand what's happening. Like if, if she's digging these furrows I don't know either. with her trunk or if she's slamming into the ground. But, you know, it looks like, well, you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that she, you know, I think she works. I'd like to see more of her. Yeah. I wish we had she had seen more of her. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's doing the uh, the Pokemon thing, but she's, you know. Yeah. Saying her name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take a bow or our rating on how our villains left the stage of life. She vibrates as she says, stage auto. Her face and her elephant's face have the same scared, beady eyes. Her hands are doing a symbol of like, it's like, it's like she's doing okay, but there, there's okay. like one okay. up and one down. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give her three out of five for that one. Um, I, I, I still have to be somewhat critical because yeah, she does have like uh, funny hands and they kind of incorporate the elephant face because the elephant eyes are like Ooh. yeah right exactly <laughs> and its nose is sticking out but it's still kind of just a, the same. a still screen screenshot uh wallpaper uh you know death so i'm gonna I'll give it two okay that's totally Not fair as strong as the villain itself um and now we're up to our rating um Hiroki is just, he's just kind of uh, rubs me the wrong way a little bit. I'm, I find him very annoying. Um, <laughs> I, I like when Kusuke says, if bicycles could fly, the sky would be filled with bicycles. <laughs> um, I like that Usagi interrupts Chibi's talk with Pegasus and accuses her of having a secret love talk with Mamo. Um, I get that it's Hiroki's dream, but I find it annoying that he doesn't want any help. And then, then he turns on a dime and is like, oh, right. 
I will take that help. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I don't like how Pegasus says, if you don't have faith in me, I can't stay with you anymore. I would like to know more about someone who I consider to be a friend, too. I mean, come on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What we can, uh, oh, you don't want to uh, be my friend. You don't want to give me uh, the benefit of the doubt. Well, then I'm out of here. Yeah, right. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. okay well, great. Well, maybe you really weren't we're my friend. we're both being jerks then. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, the overall message is good. It's good to have friends. You can accomplish so much more with friends, and it's wonderful to have friends that you can trust. I just don't feel like it's necessarily delivered in the best way. Yeah. Um, I like that Sailor Moon tells Chibi Moon that she should have more faith in herself. Um, not necessarily as bad as last week's episode, Ooh. but I'm going to give it uh, two out of five roses. Two out of five. Yeah. I think that I could be persuaded to go as high as a three. Wow. How come? It's not a perfect episode. No. And maybe it's just a rebound effect. But I feel like this could stand up. And maybe if we've graded on a curve for the uh, relentlessly inferior uh, Supers season in, 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 in as a whole. Sure. Um, I feel like this could stand with some of the other mediocre episodes from throughout the uh, <laughs> show. Sure. It's there's a lot happening. Yeah. And I was very dismayed that within like the first 90 seconds a character goes, "This is my dream." But <sighs> <laughs> but I feel like they're getting that out of the way because there's a lot of other stuff that is also going to happen. There's a lot of content in this yes. episode. Yes. And there's a lot of things that aren't working out as they usually do. The um selection of the victim and the choice of who's going to go after them by the girls is is kind of weird and different yeah and pegasus running out on chibi is is different and Pe chibi having to deal with the things alone and the girl showing up to help and the girls meeting this weird insular character who then they sort of like you know get on their side or they warm up to and chibi questioning you know what what friendship is every week Almost every week. She's learning some lesson. And I'm yeah. not sure I always like what she's learning. <laughs> but yeah. I guess we'll see uh, what the sum total is at the end once mm -hmm. we're, uh, we hit the equal sign. But I liked all that. Um, they didn't cheat a lot. Like, there's a lot of interesting and original animation in this as mm -hmm. far as the flying attempts and the attacks and the villains. I thought the animation was, was on point. Yeah. Which has not always been true. And... Um, I, there was just little aspects like <laughs> it's kind of silly, but they're like, "Hey, give it to Ami," and Ami's like, "Oh, whoa, let me just tell you, uh, I'm uh, also an uh, avionics uh, expert, and so here you go, got some uh, aerodynamic uh, things in there." I'm a um, bit of a scientist myself, right? Exactly. Uh, or um, just Vesves's weird approach to <laughs> trying to insinuate herself. It's almost like she knows that she showed up. In the last five minutes of the episode, yes. where sh she should have showed up in the first five minutes of the episode, yes, and like sidled up to this kid uh, with her goggles on and been like, "Hey, I want to know about flying. I love flying. Let's talk." And like insinuated herself. Yes, and she showed up late and was like, "All right, what do we got? And we're flying. Overdressed. We're, we're doing stuff. Yeah, right." And they're like, "Weirdo, you're floating in the sky. Oh, okay, screw this. I'll just kill you." Yeah, <laughs> but ultimately, it's again another thing where it's like. Pick a thing. What's a noun or a gerund? I like swimming. I like flying. I like running. Right. I like jumping. Uh, and then just playing it out. Yeah. And this happens just about every episode. And then also it's another thing where a character has a problem with something and then the squad is able to help them. Yeah. Like fixing the car. Right. Right. We're right. We're just right. doing fixing the car over again. We are. Only it has less emotional resonance because I don't know why this kid wants to fly. I have it's no idea. Like his dead girlfriend really wanted him to build this plane or something like that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so not as strong as building the car. No. Here's some bad things. Um, it was a terrible lesson. I mean, the ultimate yeah. lesson about trusting your friends is sure. fine. Yeah. But. The execution of the lesson yes. and hinging it all on a eight-year-old girl who cannot make decisions like this about strange people in their lives right. should not be. And then playing all the clear 
and they've done this before, but all the clear chances for this travesty to come to an end. Yeah. As like, whoa, <laughs> my mother's sister almost caught me talking to this stranger who lives in my head or in my room. Oh, my God. And playing that for laughs just feels weird as the entire season has always felt. Yeah. But it was well executed, this episode, I thought. Yes. Bad subject matter, well executed, like a Clint Eastwood movie. <laughs> That he directed, of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. So for that reason, you know, I give it a three. Okay. My English title is Defying Flying. Defying Defying Flying. Yes. Throws on the vying. Yes. Yes. Good stuff. Mine is Gaslight as a Feather. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. That's that's pretty good. <laughs> Next episode, we are talking about episode number 158, Pegasus no Himitsu, Yume Sekai o Mamoru Bishonen in Japanese, Pegasus's Secret, The Boy Who Protects the Dream World, the English translation, and the English title, Pegasus Revealed. Ooh. Yeah. So this isn't just a fluke, uh, having something that challenges the... Uh, the mythology of Pegasus. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we're going to go right into something else. Uh -huh. Wow. We might. An escalation. This only took After how many so episodes? so many episodes. I know. Finally, we're going to move it forward. I know. I can't wait for that. Uh, moving it forward. That's what we want to do. Yes. Move we, the needle forward. We want to always move the needle. And the needle has been spiked this week <laughs> by the onboarding of a brand new inner senshi by the name of Marissa. Nice. Marissa has joined us on our Patreon and getting access to all of our extended content there. So welcome aboard, Marissa. It's great to have you. Welcome, Marissa. Uh, one of the things that Marissa um, likes about our Patreon is our Revolutionary Girl Utena show. Nice. The Duels of the Game. Very nice. Uh, where I watch a Revolutionary Girl Utena and try to understand it. And find myself falling deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole of semiotics and symbology in that <laughs> freaking show. And it's <laughs> we're, we're getting into it, uh, getting deeper and deeper every week. And so if you want to join me on that journey, you can by going to patreon.com forward slash Sailor Noob and becoming a senshi today. Get access to other podcasts, our outtakes and our extended content. That's at patreon.com forward slash Sailor Noob. And as always, if you like Sailor Noob, you like the show, tell a friend and share it on social media. Well, that's our show for this week. In the name of the moon, we'll be punishing you next week with another episode of Sailor Noob. Hi, oh, me. 